Christmas story. Not uh, a Christmas story that involves uh, shooting your eye out and a leg lamp and, and uh, eating soap and <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we, we get a lot of, uh, unfortunately, I believe our culture, especially, um, well, I guess our culture everywhere, but especially Westerners, we get the Christmas story um, mixed up a lot now. Uh, and um, I think part of the charge of the church is to help bring us back into celebrating Christmas for what it really is. And um, we all may remember the entertainer Carmen. He he um, had a song about celebrating Jesus. That's what Christmas means to him. I won't sing it for you, but I would love to. But uh, but uh, for sake of time today, maybe maybe next Sunday. But uh, uh, that's what Christmas celebrating Jesus. You know, it's what Christians do all year round. You know, so uh, we emphasize the birth of Jesus at, at Christmas. If he never came. There never would have been a sinless life. There never would have been an opportunity for redemption. So we're thankful that God came, became a man. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, some aspects of the Christmas story. And uh, today we're going to talk about Christmas planned. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. And you think, man, Christmas started back in Genesis? Uh, and so I'm going to show you that today and, and help you to understand uh, you know, God's plan for Christmas and what, what it's all about. And, and um, you know, as you're turning, I want to, uh, I guess I'll start out by just sharing a story. I told you all a few, few weeks ago that I really uh, enjoyed a few novels that I read when I talk about reading, and one of them that I read that I really liked was the Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, and and um, in the story, if you if you're not familiar with it, which most of us probably are somewhat, but in the story of Robinson Crusoe, uh, it's a story about a, a man who's stranded on an island. Um, I believe the island is off the coast of Venezuela or somewhere. It's a remote island, and he's stranded there for a total of 28 years, and for 24 years he's on the island. And he uh, hasn't encountered another human being. He has a, um, I can't remember, a goat and a, a talking parrot and maybe one other animal, maybe a dog or something, I can't remember. But, but um, you know, that's the only interaction that he had, really. But he, um, he starts in encountering these cannibals that are coming to a certain part of the beach uh, after 24 years of being on the island. And they would come and they would well, do what cannibals do. With, and he rescued a man from these cannibals on one day, and, and uh, it was a Friday, and um, he developed this relationship with this, uh, this uh, native of the island, and he called him Friday because that's the day he rescued him. And, and as he began to develop this relationship with Friday, he uh, taught Friday English. And so Fri he, you know, he couldn't communicate with him much at all at first, but he taught him English, and in uh, teaching him English, he eventually introduced him to Christ, and Friday became a Christian. And so in this novel, you see some mission at work where God actually brought a man to him, and, and, uh, and it's interesting. But, but anyway, as he began to teach Friday about things that, from Scripture, um, he, you know, Friday didn't really have any trouble accepting most of the tenets of of Scripture and the doctrines that Crusoe would teach him, except for one. He had a problem with the doctrine of the devil. He, he, this concept of the devil was difficult for him. And, and so Crusoe says that, you know, he told him how the devil was God's enemy in the hearts of men and how he used malice and skill to defeat all the good designs of God's providence in the world. And he was trying to ruin the kingdom of Christ in the world and things like that. And so Friday asks Robinson Crusoe a, a perplexing question. And I'm going to read, read the quote for you. He says, this is why he had trouble understanding the concept of the devil. He said, if God, much stronger, much might as the wicked devil, why God no kill the devil, so make him no more do wicked? 
So, not good English, but that's a good question. A lot of people raise that question. So basically, he was asking Robin Segura, he says, if God is so much stronger than the devil, why doesn't God just kill the devil so that he cannot make any more evil? Hmm. And so Crusoe admits when he asked him, he says, you know, he didn't really know what to say. He had to ponder on it. And he, eventually he comes back with some explanations that I, I think are pretty good. But, but Crusoe had no immediate answer to Friday's question. But I want to tell you, the Bible has an answer for that, for that question. And that answer became real at Christmas. And today we're going all the way back to Genesis and in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we're going to see something I've introduced to you before called the Proto-Evangelium. And that's a big fancy word that I love to say because it, you know, it impresses people. But, but really, it's not that, not that difficult. Proto means first. At Evangelium, maybe you can detect it. Some people pronounce it Evangelium. Uh, you hear the word evangelize in there. And so it's the first evangelism. And evangelize simply means to share the good news. So it's the first hint of the gospel. It's the first good news. It's the first message of the gospel in the Bible. It's the first hint all the way back in the Garden of Eden after the fall of Adam and Eve. This was the message preached by God himself as he revealed his divine plan to the serpent that old deceiver, the devil himself, uh, in the presence of Adam and Eve. And I want you to read it with me. In Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read verses 14 and 15. God's word says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of God. Let's, let's pray for a moment. Father, we bow before you this morning and uh, God, we're so thankful today that we have a Christmas to celebrate. And uh, Lord, if it was all just about giving and sharing and gathering with family and eating and all those good things, it would, it would be good. But ultimately, it's about you and uh, Lord, your good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and you coming into our world to redeem people and your creation, all your creation from sin. God, speak to our hearts today. God, turn every heart towards you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So when we look at this story of Christmas here, the sto listen, the story of Christmas really is about God's plan to destroy the works of the devil and to redeem fallen man and all his creation for his glory forever by sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world, right? That's what it's about. That's what Christmas is about. And we all know the devil's a liar. He's a lying, thieving, murderer, full of hate and evil. And, <clears throat> you know, you would think that during Christmas time, you know, we always say peace on earth, goodwill toward men, quoting the angels and, and that kind of thing. You'd think at Christmas time there would be peace and, and there would be pause and there would be harmony and there would be love. And there is a lot of that, but you know what? I think Satan works overtime at Christmas a lot of times. Uh, when all the rest of the world should be celebrating the birth of Emmanuel, the devil is busy at work propping up selfishness and greed and, and pride and, and power. And you know, a lot of times families can't even gather together because of the tension. Uh, that's created and that kind of thing. And, and a lot of times it, it's, it's the most miserable time of the year for a lot of people. More people commit suicide during Christmas than any other time of the year. That's been an ongoing statistic for a long time. So but what, so what I want to do today is I want to remind you a little bit about why we have Christmas at all and how the real Christmas story was planned by God 
by showing you three distinct characteristics from this first hint of a coming Christmas planned by God. All right? Because we know Christmas is about the birth of Jesus. And in this text, God prophesies the coming of a babe. All right? So here we have it. The number, for, the number one characteristic that I want you to note this morning is this. I want you to understand that the Christmas story initiates with a curse. It begins with a curse. And, and so when we look at this text in verse 14, we see the Lord Yahweh said to the serpent, because you've done this, done what? He, he deceived Eve, didn't he? And he tricked her. And, 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 uh, and, and, they, and, and Adam and Eve both fell from the God's grace and fell into sin. And so <clears throat> this is a curse that God placed upon the serpent because he was the instrument used to tempt Eve and Adam with her to eat from the forbidden eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so what is this curse? Well, look at the text. He says, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. You see that? That's the curse. Now, a lot of people say before this the serpent had legs and all that. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's stuff in the Bible, but, but that's not really important. What, what is important is the curse is that the snake's going to crawl on his belly, the serpent's going to crawl on his belly, and he's going to eat dust. Now, eating dust is pretty, pretty peculiar, I think, here. But, but think about it. Eating dust represents total defeat. It really does. I mean, you, you know, just think about it. Don't you know, if you're in a battle, and you get knocked down to the ground, and you find yourself spitting dust out of your mouth, it's pretty much over at that point. You know what I mean? I mean, but that's kind of what it represents. And, and there are other places in the Old Testament where eating dust does definitely represent defeat. And so that's what we see here. And so this is a, a prophecy of a curse of defeat for uh, Satan. And so the curse was not directed simply to this reptile, but it was more of a curse to the spiritual being that the, that the serpent represented. You see, every time, listen, think about this. Every time you see a snake slithering along, along on the ground on its belly, I want you to do this. I want, I want that to be a reminder to you that God has cursed the devil. You hear me? Think about that. Every time you see one, it ought to be a reminder because that's what this is. That's what God has said. That's God's curse upon that snake because of sin. And that ought to be a reminder. You know, just like the rainbow is a natural event that God gave to Noah of a promise to never flood the world again uh, because uh, of sin, right? To never flood the world again, he gave us this rainbow, and it's a natural event. And when we see the rainbow, that's what we're supposed to remember, is that God gave us this promise. And in the same way, every time you see a snake, I want you to think in your mind, God cursed the devil. That's what it's a reminder of. And that's what instigated a lot of this. That's what kind of what instigated Christmas was, was this curse of sin. And so, did you know... That God cursed Satan even before man was ever created? This wasn't the only curse. This was just a continuing curse. And so we've talked about some of this a little bit in our small groups on Wednesday night. It's came up at, at, at uh, our place a few times, but we've not really delved into it too much. But I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 14 with me at a couple of verses, a few verses here. And I want you to see something unique about Satan and, and this curse. Satan... I understand this. Satan is a created being who desired to become God. That's what, that's what the Bible teaches us. That's one of the things that we learn about him and his curse. Look what Isaiah wrote, the prophet. He says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, look at this, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. And so, then he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will make myself like the Most High. You see those things? Now, this is a prophecy of, the, of, uh, of Isaiah, of the king of Babylon. Uh, but uh, it, this is more than just the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon is not going to ascend into the clouds. And in, in all Old Testament prophecies, there's usually, almost all, there's usually a dual meaning. There's an earthly meaning, and there's a heavenly, or, or, a, or a future meaning. There's a, a present fulfillment, or, and a latter fulfillment. You see that time and time again, and we'll look at another one of those instances next week. But, but when we look at this, what we see here is the prophet is describing Satan. And most theologians believe that this is definitely pointing to Satan because of, of some of the language that's used here. You see, before his fall, Satan had a different name. And in, in this translation, in the ESV, it says, O Day Star, Son of Dawn. You see that? That's the, that's the name that we see for Satan given here. And um, in some translations, if you have the King James or New King James, I think it's translated Lucifer. And Lucifer is simply an old English name that means a light bearer. That's what it means. And so you can see the similarities and why uh, maybe they're translated one or the other. And, and so when we look at this passage, we see what a lot of people refer to as the five I wills of Satan. That's what they call them, the five I wills. And so uh, I want to look at them really quickly and, and just to kind of help you stand understand why Satan was cursed and, and where his heart was. They reveal the heart of Satan. He says, first he says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. You see that in verse 13? And so the stars of God likely refer to all the other angels of God. So he's placing himself above all the angels. He says, I will set my throne on high. You see, Lucifer wasn't content to bow before the throne of God. He wanted to sit on the throne of God himself. And so he wanted to take God's throne from him. And then he says, I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. And so this mount of assembly uh, refers to the place where all the worshipers of God gather. And Lucifer uh, is saying, basically, I want to sit where all that come can worship me in the place of God. And then he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And that refers to the fact that he wanted to dwell in the place of glory for God. That's where he wanted to dwell. He wanted the glory of God above the clouds. And he says, and I will make myself like the Most High. He says, ultimately we see Lucifer wanted God's place in the universe, don't we? That's what we see. He wanted to usurp the throne of God. And take the place of God. And the result of this evil desire of his heart. The Bible says that God cast him down out of heaven. And it was his pride that led to that fall. We see another passage in Ezekiel. Directed toward another earthly king. The king of Tyre. But it exceeds the description of any earthly king as well. And if you will look in Ezekiel 28. And we see some more about Satan's fall. In verse 12, he says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You see, you were in Eden. No earthly king was ever in Eden, so we know this exceeds the king of Tyre. He was not in Eden. The garden of God, every precious stone was your covering. He names all these crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. And on the day that you were created, they were prepared. And he says, you were anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways. Now look at verse 15. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. It can only really describe Satan. Uh, only really him. And so based on this passage, what we see is, you know, Lucifer was once a beautiful created being. Now you've probably heard a lot of this stuff your whole life. The text says he was an anointed guardian cherub, sort of a captain of angels. But sometime, and we don't know exactly when, but sometime before man, Lucifer became so proud of his beauty and so enthralled with himself and his role 
before God that he rebelled against God and led other angels to rebel against God with him. And those angels now serve as his demons. And God cast them out of his heaven. And so Satan ultimately is a created fallen angel who wants to be God himself. And he was thrown out of heaven for this. And then he came, after all this, then he came, this is important, he came to human beings and enticed them to sin and rebel against God. So not only did he entice other angels to rebel against God with him, he enticed man to sin against God with him. Adam and Eve. And thus God's curse. And that was his action there in the Garden of Eden. And folks, let me tell you something. That is still action that he's doing today. He's doing everything he can to entice you and I and me to rebel against God. That's what his work is. That's what he does. And that, folks, is why Satan is cursed. And the Christmas story begins with that curse. The Christmas story initiates with a curse. So, that's the first characteristic we see, a curse. Another characteristic that we see in this story that I want you to pay attention to is the conflict. And I've already kind of introduced it to you here in closing out the first point. But the Christmas story involves a conflict. When you look at verse 15, you see this word enmity. You see that? I will put enmity between you and and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. That's what he's talking about. The first part of verse 15. Now, now some folks say that all this verse means is that from this time forward, from, from the fall and when this curse is pronounced, that from that time on, people hated snakes and snakes hated people and people try to stomp the heads of snakes with their heel, and snakes try to strike at the heels of people, and that's all it means. And you know, it does mean that. <laughs> but just like so much more Scripture, it's easy to see God has shown us so much more here because of the context we can see it. Here we have this prophetic Scripture and we see this conflict, this enmity between the offspring of the woman. Now, who's the offspring of the woman? The Bible says Eve is the mother of all living. So the offspring of the woman ultimately is every person who's ever lived. That's you and I, right? We are the offspring of the woman. And so there's this enmity between the offspring of the woman. And then he says, and the offspring of the serpent. Now, who's the offspring of the serpent? Well, it's definitely the demons that followed him and any other person or thing, I think, that serves his purposes. There's enmity, there's conflict there. And now the word enmity is the word for hostility. Now, everybody hopefully understands hostility, but, but there's, there's the state of enmity is warfare. When you have an en enemy, you are at odds against them, and when you're uh, engaged there's a battle and the feeling of enmity is hate hatred and so they go hand in hand and I want, I want to show that to you Satan you got to understand Satan hates hum humanity and Satan is at war with humanity you understand that Satan hates you <laughs> did you know Satan hates you he absolutely hates you you know why Satan hates you? Satan hates you because I want to tell you, because God loves you. That's why Satan hates you, because Satan hates God. And he hates you because he hates God. Because God loves you, he hates you. You see, Satan hates people because God loves people. And I want to tell you, God loves you deeply. Nobody loves you more than God loves you. You realize that? He wants you, God wants you to experience life as he planned for you to experience life. And you're never going to be able to do that without him. He loves you. He wants you to have life and to, and to have the life that he planned. But you know what? You have an enemy that hates you. 
because he hates God, and that's the devil. But, but God wants you to have life. John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, the thief, you know what he's talking about when he says thief? That's the devil. The devil's the thief. <laughs> the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Satan wants to steal from you, but God wants, you, wants to give you all uh, the greatest of all gifts. Right? Satan wants to kill you, but God wants to give you eternal, abundant life. Satan wants you to be destroyed forever, but God wants to bless you forever. Satan knows how much God loves you, and because... Satan hates God. Satan hates you. In John chapter 8, Jesus is addressing some Pharisees and, and um, he's talking about their character a little bit and, and how, who it emulates. And look what he says in verse 44. He says, You are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Let me tell you something. Satan is at work to deceive you and to defeat you. He wants you to believe that you can... Listen to me. Satan wants you to believe that you can sin. And it won't hurt you. Did you know that? Satan wants you to believe that you can, you can do whatever you want. It really don't matter because Jesus loves you and, and that sin won't hurt you. And he wants you to believe that that, that that sin won't hurt anybody else. Oh yeah, yeah, you just, you're all right. You know, Je Jesus loves you. You're going to be fine. You, you, you're going to be fine and everybody else is going to be fine. I'll tell you something. The results are in and that's a lie. You can't sin and it not hurt you. And you can't sin and it not hurt others. Those are lies from, guess what? The liar. The father of lies. That's what Jesus called him. You know, and, and, and here's something else he wants you to know. He wants you to believe. You know, it's one extreme. The other. He wants you to believe you're going to be all right no matter what you do. But another thing he, he is, is once you sin, sometimes he does this. He wants you to believe that you are hopeless and that you can never be forgiven. You're too far gone. Satan wants you to think, I can never be forgiven. I'm just a sinner, and I've tried, and, and, I, and God, God doesn't want me anymore. Let me tell you something. That is a lie. <laughs> hey, listen to me. Don't believe a liar. Don't you ever believe a liar, because you know what a liar will do? They'll lie to you. <laughs> and that means it's not the truth. And that'll hurt you, and it'll hurt people around you. There are people here today that are being deceived by the devil. There are people watching online that have believed Satan's lies. God wants you to, I mean, Satan wants you to doubt God and instead to believe him. And when God spoke this curse, he spoke it in the presence of Adam and Eve. Did you notice that? God put this curse on the serpent, on the devil, in the presence of Adam, Adam and Eve. As soon, listen, as soon as Adam and Eve were created, Satan hated them. He hated them. You know, <laughs> Eve, and, and, and we know this, if you go back and read the story, Eve thought, thought that Satan was her friend. You know, she walks up to him, she engages with him in conversation, right? And, and then... Uh, she listened to his advice and counsel, followed his counsel. And it hurt her, and it hurt Adam, and it hurt you and me, didn't it? It affected us all. <laughs> you know, and, and so that just goes right with what we just said. So with, but with this pronouncement of this curse, one thing God is doing is, is God is warning all of humanity that Satan is your enemy. <laughs> that's, that's what's going on here. It's, it's one of the most important things that you need to know as you try to follow Jesus. Satan is your enemy. He wants to deceive you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. 
That's what he wants. Satan hates you. And so, God warns us all of this enmity with Satan. The, the, you know, here's something else. The, the fact that sin results in suffering is an act of God's grace. Do you realize that? When we sin, you can't, you can't sin without enduring a little suffering, you know? And that's God's grace. You want to know why? You think, well, how can that be God's grace? Well, think about it. If you could sin without any suffering, without any consequences, you'd go right into hell with a smile on. But because of suffering, God draws you to Him to deliver you. You see that? It's an act of God's grace so that you'll turn from sin and turn to the Lord and be saved. Let me tell you something. Satan hates you. He hates you. And I want to ask you this. Do you hate him? God says to love everybody, don't he? But I'm going to tell you something. Don't include the devil. It's all right to hate him. Because he hates you. And he hates God. And he's out to destroy you. And you know what else? Y'all ought ought not only hate him, y'all ought to hate sin. Because that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to use sin to destroy you and your life and your relationship. So Christmas begins with a conflict and, and, and this curse. And I want to show you another characteristic of the real Christmas to you this morning. And this is the good news. The Christmas story includes a conqueror. There's a, the, the curse and the conflict. There's also a conqueror. Praise the Lord. Look at the last part of, or we'll look at verse 15 with me. This is the, like I said earlier, this is the first indication that Jesus would be born of a woman. It's the announcement of a coming Christmas. Look, the offspring of the woman. Now look at the last clause. It begins with, he shall bruise your head. It's a son. You see that? It's specifically a son. It's an announcement of Christmas. The coming conqueror will be offspring of the woman the announcement of a coming Christmas in this announcement the word bruise is used two times you see it he says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel now the word that's translated bruise in my translation sometimes is translated to strike and and it's it's the idea of Striking and creating a bruise. You know, if you're bruised, it means you're hit with something. And so that's the reason they translate it that way. But let me ask you something. Is it, is, does it, is it the same if you get hit with the same blow in the heel as it is if you get hit in the side of the head? It's not the same, is it? Ain't anybody in here rather be hit in the head than the heel, I'll guarantee you. Even though the heel can be painful. And that's what it's saying. There is some pain involved. But it's the crushing of the serpent's head that I want you to pay attention to. So we see the seed of the woman. Now there will be some injury. Some, you know, of course, the crucifixion. You know, is I think what he, he's talking about here. But that heel will crush the head of Satan. And when Jesus came out of the grave victorious over sin and death, he crushed the head of Satan forever. Because Satan had to know then it's over. You know for sure. And so, but it's Jesus that delivers that defeating blow. And how do we know it's Jesus? If you turn over to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, I want want you to notice an important verse. Paul writes, he says, when the fullness of time, when it was just the right time, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Feeds right out of Genesis 3.15, doesn't it? Born of a woman. The description born of a woman, it reminds us of the importance of the virgin birth of Jesus. You see, Jesus wasn't born of the seed of man. But he was born of a woman. Jesus had no earthly father. During that first Christmas season that we read about in the first of the Gospels, and we'll see that in a couple weeks, Mary became pregnant with this offspring that's mentioned in Genesis 3.15, the Christ, through a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit of God. 
not by the actions of any man. Okay? So he's the, he's the offspring of a woman, but not any man. That's important. And, uh, man, we could spend all day on just that. But, but, but what I want you to see is that this means it's Jesus, the unique Son of God that will strike the head of the enemy. You see, Jesus came to defeat Satan by living a sinless life and dying on the cross for our sins. Look at 1 John 3, 8. He says, <coughs> excuse me. I, might, I, I, wonder, I want you to see this, but I especially want you to pay attention to the, the last part of this. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You see that? That's important to our, to our text today, our beginning text. But, but let's take the whole thing really quickly. Listen to me. The practice of sinning. I just want to say it this way. If your lifestyle is characterized by sin, basically he says you are of the devil. When people look at your life and what they see is a, a sinner, then that means you're of the devil. That's what it says. All right? And he says the devil's been sinning from the beginning. And that's, that's it. You're, you know, that's the description of the devil. That describes you boom, like father, like son. Right? The reason, this, he says, and this is the reason. This is the reason the Son of God appeared. This is the reason God planned Christmas to destroy the works of the devil. You see that? That's what Christmas is about. To destroy the works of the devil. Look, that's what he did when he died on Calvary's cross and arose from the grave. And, and, and listen, it doesn't end there. Because Jesus defeated Satan and sin, you can defeat Satan too. Did you know that? Look in Romans 16, 20 real quickly. With me. We're almost done. He says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Who's he? He's talking to you. He's talking to the church. He's not talking about Jesus here. This is, a, this is for you and me. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. How in the world... Does that happen? He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You can crush Satan under your feet because of the grace of God. That's some good stuff right there, you know? And I want to I kind of wrap things up by just kind of giving you a few quick ways that you can defeat Satan in your life because of the work of King Jesus. All right, number one, you, you might want to write these down. These can be helpful to you. Number one, remember that victory is already yours. You know, victory is already yours. Jesus has already won. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, it says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. That's past tense. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The victory is won already. Another thing you can do is not only remember the victory is already won, but pray for deliverance. In Matthew chapter 6, in the model prayer, Jesus says in verse 13, He says, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, from wickedness. And some people, it can be translated, to deliver us from the evil one. The one who seeks to destroy you. Pray for deliverance. Because he's at work still trying to destroy you and drag you down. Another thing you can do is to expose evil. Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. You know what? In our culture, this is, this is coming true. But, you know, and it scares some people to death. But, but we need to quit hiding our sin. We need to expose it. We need to expose wickedness. Cover-ups don't help anybody. And that's what the Bible says. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Bring the truth out. And, and finally, resist evil. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Good advice right there. Good advice.
Now, I want to close by telling you another interesting story. An intriguing painting was once displayed at the Louvre. And I think it was called Checkmate. It was produced by a painter, Moritz Rich. I don't know, something like that. But what this painting depicts is two chess players. One of the players is Satan. And he appears arrogantly confident. He's got this look on his face of victory. And the other player is a young man who has this distressed, forlorn depiction of defeat. And according to tradition, the reason he looks that way is because on the chessboard, Satan has ultimately defeated this young man. Satan has these black chess pieces. The young man's playing these white chess pieces. And he, supposedly he has this young man in checkmate. And the bargain was his soul. So the young man's sitting there looking at the board, defeated, distressed, obviously, thinking he's, it's over. He's lost his soul. And it's said that many champion chess players would come through and they would look at that painting and a lot of times they'd spend a lot of time looking at it, you know, trying to figure out if the young man had any move. And time and time again they would leave and there, there's, there's no hope. But finally an undefeated champion at chess visited the museum and they said he, he stopped and he started studying the painting and and he, he would look at it, and you could see him, you know, kind of moving and moving. And he stood there for hours and contemplating. And all of a sudden, he burst out with excitement. And he said, young man, the king has another move. It was not lost. He noticed that the king had one more move that ultimately would lead him to victory. And so today I want you to understand this. You may feel that you have no hope because you're surely defeated by sin and the devil. No, your world might seem to crumble around you and all may seem to be lost. I want to tell you that there's yet one move that can deliver you and give you sweet victory. Allow the king of all kings to move into your heart and your life. And when you come to King Jesus, you can experience victory. Sweet victory. And that, folks, is why God planned Christmas. From the very beginning, so that Satan could be destroyed and all his works, and all humanity could be saved. That's what Christmas is about. And so right now, let's bow our heads. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe you're here today, and you're, you are defeated. You're depressed, and you're discouraged. And I want to tell you, there's hope in Jesus. Satan wants to destroy you, and if you allow him to have his way, he ultimately can and will but we don't even need him we can destroy ourselves right now i want to urge you to call out to king jesus and let him move into your heart and life will you do that let's pray together and let's respond in faith father right now we give you this time lord be glorified in it call sinners to faith Lord, draw us all into your presence and your care. In Jesus' name, amen. God, speak into your heart right now. Just step out. Come on down. Let's pray. Let's get our hearts and minds right with the Lord. Come on.